Well, we're finishing today our series, our, our series of lessons on uh, kind of the post-resurrection ramifications, the things that happened after the resurrection. If you remember, we started out by talking about doubting Thomas, and then we discussed a little bit the, the importance of the resurrection and how Jesus taught the apostles that that was going to be the core of their message. We've talked a little bit about the power of Jesus flowing in our lives that was released at the resurrection. We've talked about the, the abundance of life that we can have because the resurrection has happened. But today I want to talk about the pinnacle of the effects of the resurrection in our lives, the day of Pentecost. I want to uh, explain a little bit about what the scripture says about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. So if you'd like to turn to John chapter 16, I'm going to start in the middle of verse 4 there in just a little bit, and we're going to see what Jesus told us. Now, the best way I can think of to illustrate the need of the Holy Spirit in our life is to remember the story of little Susie. Does anybody remember the story of little Susie who was afraid of the dark? She was scared to death when mom would take her and tuck her into bed, she was scared to death of the dark and she would scream every time. And, and her mother did everything she could think of to alleviate this fear. She, she would go in and tuck her in and encourage her and tell her that everything was fine. She opened the closet door. She looked under the bed. She looked in the toy box. There's no monsters. But every night she was terrified of the dark. Finally, mom had the idea one time that she would tell little Susie to, to pray. So she said, you need to talk to Jesus. When you're scared, talk to Jesus. Jesus is everywhere. Jesus is right here with you. All you need to do is talk to him about what you're afraid of, and he'll take care of you. Mom got up, shut the light off, and went out in the hallway, and little Susie screamed bloody murder. And mom ran back in and very patiently comforted her daughter and said, but, but Susie, didn't you talk to Jesus? Susie said, Mama, I talked to Jesus, but right now I need somebody with skin on. She's talking about that presence that we need to be able to feel. That presence that, that someone is there and taking care of us, someone who has the ability. And, and we don't lose that when we grow up. We just learn to hide it a little bit better. As we get older, we, we still need that presence when life hurts. Uh, well, the... Um, prayer meeting on Wednesday night has been recognizing the number of widows and widowers in our congregation. And every one of them knows that feeling of hurt when a spouse is lost, and the emptiness and the uh, aloneness that comes with that. Some of us have, have, have kids, and our kids aren't necessarily living the way we think they should, and we know that kind of pain as well. Or, or maybe we have a spouse, and they're not fulfilling their vows, and that kind of pain really hurts. We need some presence in our life to get us through that. Many times we live a life of fear. Um, when you listen to the news, it seems like the news is designed to generate fear. Wars and rumors of wars, like Jesus said would happen. He said those things must happen. He said not to worry, the end is, that doesn't mean the end has come. Or, or maybe you uh, listen to the business news on Fox or one of those other channels. And how weak they say our economy is. How it's declining. And how the interest rates are going up and returns are going down. And many of us rely on our savings for our daily living. And it can generate a lot of fear. Who do we turn to when we have that kind of fear? Another thing that we don't talk about very much in our Western world is shame. One of the things that attack people, one of the ways our enemy attacks us, I guess would be another way to say it, is to attack our personal value. Shame is not guilt. Guilt is, guilt is when you realize you've done something wrong and that wrong needs to be corrected. That's guilt. Shame is when you think you yourself personally have no value. Oftentimes, that's an attack from our enemy. Who do we turn to? When we, say, when we are tempted to think, I have no value. I should be replaced. We are not alone in this. Even more so, the 
apostles in our reading today in, in the book of John are going to feel that loneliness. In fact, this is John's recording of what Jesus said the night that he was betrayed when he's preparing his apostles for his leaving. He's going to be gone, and they will have no direct connection with him anymore. What are they going to do now? Are they really going to be alone? He had started in the upper room when he washed the disciples' feet in John 13. He worked through John 14 and 15 talking about how they still need to rely on what Jesus has taught them. But he's made it very clear that they will look for him and not find him. They will be alone. Then in verse 4, in the middle of verse 4 there, there's a new paragraph in my translation of the scripture. Verse 4 says, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Jesus is encouraging them. That even though he's leaving, he's not going to leave them, as he'll say later, as orphans. They won't really be alone. The helper is coming. The counselor is coming. The Holy Spirit, we know from reading the rest of the passages here. And that the Spirit is going to come and he is going to represent Jesus. In verse 7, he says it this way. He says, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. I will send him as a messenger, as a representative of Jesus to be with them. Now, that's an encouraging thing. They didn't understand it yet at this point. But before very many years, Matthew is going to be staying in Jerusalem and the Israelite area. But uh, Paul will be taking the gospel all the way to Spain. Others of the apostles, like Andrew, will travel as far east as India. John Mark will travel across the north edge of the African continent and plant churches in places like Alexandria. They will be all over the world planting churches. And because Jesus has gone to his Father and sent the Spirit, the Spirit can go with each one of them to different parts of the world unhindered by a physical body. If Jesus decided to plant the church without ever ascending to his father, by staying on earth, the church in the world today would still be in Jerusalem. Because as one limited by a body, Jesus would not be able to travel other places. And not just the apostles, but to everyone. He's going to send the Spirit to all believers. And in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, you'll begin to see that as he descends on the 120. And they begin to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ immediately as representatives of Jesus Christ. More than that, when the Spirit appears, he will begin to work behind the scenes to bring conviction to the world. Notice it said that specifically, to the world. That's a, that's a New Testament code for people who are not yet believers in Jesus Christ. And he's going to do this by bringing conviction. Conviction of sin, specifically. And he says, sin because they do not believe in me. 
indicating that from the minute Jesus dies on the cross, the only thing that can separate a person from God the Father is an unbelief in Jesus or or not receiving the gift that Jesus offers of the grace of forgiveness. He'll go on to say, convict them also of righteousness. Righteousness because they can no longer see Jesus. Jesus is the perfect illustration of righteousness. And in Jesus' day, when he walked on this earth, people would look at Jesus and see exactly what God wanted a human being to be. But Jesus has left the earth. And we have no illustration of righteousness. Um, I think of it as um, grading on a curve. Many times I talk to people about my, their faith in Jesus Christ and my faith in Jesus Christ, and frequently I'll run into somebody who says, well, I'm not all that bad. My sins aren't all that great. And I even had one person one time, <laughs> I don't know what he think, thought he was saying, but he said, well, at least I'm not as bad as Hitler. What that betrays to me, anyway, it shows me that what they're thinking is is that God is going to grade on a curve. God has got room in heaven for 80% of the people that are ever born. So he's going to, he's going to bring 80% of the people into heaven. Jesus skewed the curve. See, the way a curve works, I don't know if you know this or not, but the way the cur- a curve works is you, you give everybody the test, and then you look at how everybody scored, and say, say the highest person on the test got an 80%. So to, to build the curve, you just add 20%, you know, 100% minus 80% is 20%. So you add 20% to the scores, and you move everybody's scores up. I did that. We did that one time in, in high school. We had a history teacher that graded on the curve, and every single person failed a test. Everybody got below 20%. So he announced that he would re, uh, re-give the test. Everybody could take it again, and he would grade it on a curve this time. So the highest score would be 100%. You know, even if they only got half the questions right, that would be 100%. Well, the first person who took the test got 100%. He skewed the curve. There's no extra points to give. Jesus set the standard at perfection. And we have no illustration of perfection because Jesus physically is gone. But the Spirit will come and convict the world that they are not that perfect. They haven't met that standard and they need a Savior. And He'll continue to convict them to the point where they realize that judgment is coming. Jesus says they'll convict them of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. There's two two words for judgment in that verse. The first one is krisis, and it means an evaluation. An evaluation is coming. And they need to know that because the prince of this world is krano. It's a related word, but it's subtly different, and it means condemned, punished, rejected. And so the Spirit will enter a person's life who's not yet a believer and and convince them that they are in jeopardy. In essence, what Jesus is saying here is the Spirit will go before a believer and deliver the bad news. We as Christians like to talk about the good news, but there's a bad news that goes with it. The bad news is that God is real. Perfection is the standard. You haven't met the standard. And that means things are going to go bad. Unfortunately, Jesus went to the cross and paid the price for that lack of meeting the standard and now can give forgiveness and salvation to anyone he chooses to. And the only requirement for receiving that is to trust him that he'll do it. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 say, It's by grace you have been saved through faith. Not by works. You can't do anything to work for your salvation. It's the gift of God. We have to be humble enough to ask for it and receive it. 
Now, the passage says that the Spirit will convict the world. But you know what I found out? And if you look through other parts of the Scripture, you'll find this too. The Spirit doesn't stop when you're saved. The Spirit continues to bring conviction to the saved person. We can't just limit this to somebody, somebody else and say, oh, well, I'm off the hook. They're, they're the ones this applies to. Believers sin as well. And without the Spirit's work in our life, sometimes we don't know what we don't know. And so we don't know how to change. We don't know when we're not doing the right thing. And the Spirit whispers in the back of our mind, that should change. And then he shows you what might happen sometimes if you don't change. And the whole purpose is so that you will see Jesus. And you will become someone other people can see Jesus in. Notice how Jesus continues, starting in verse 12, talking about how he will work in the believer's life. He will be their guide. And what does he guide to? He guides to the things that Jesus taught. He tells the apostles, he says, I'd like to teach you a lot more stuff, but you're, t- you're grieving too much. You're too sorrowed. Your, your hearts can't handle it. So I'll send the Spirit, and the Spirit will guide you to all truth. All the things that I have for you, Jesus says. He will not teach you things of his own. He will teach you things that have come from me and from my Father, because everything my Father has is mine, and everything I have is his. And so the Spirit will lead you to the Father and to the Son. Now, it's not nearly as prevalent as it used to be. But once in a while, we run into a group of Christians that have misunderstood this or never been taught this. Uh, I actually attended a uh, catechism class one time when I was a child where the uh, pastor got up and said, you know, what Jesus did for us is great. That's wonderful. But that's in the past. That really doesn't have much for us today. And then he said, it's the Holy Spirit that we have to focus on today. We can kind of put Jesus on the shelf and just look at what the Spirit is doing. I didn't know what it was at that point. I think the Spirit may have been protecting me, but I I realized that there was something not quite right with that. And then I found this passage and that the Spirit, when He works, He will always direct you back to Jesus. He won't direct you to Himself. Let the Spirit lead us back to Jesus. Back to the things that he taught. Back to the things that he has for us. The Spirit gives us all the things that we need. He represents Jesus to us. He brings conviction. And he gives us the guidance to live like Jesus wanted us to live. So what's our part? What do we do in response to that? It's quite simple, actually. We cooperate. We follow the Spirit's leading. Paul talked about it in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, Paul says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The Spirit is the one who uh, is our evidence. When we stand um, someday in before God, and He looks down and sees Jesus as our defender, and the Spirit in our life, He knows He's got evidence that we have been believers of Jesus Christ. He's been guiding us into the image of Christ all of our lives, all of our saved life. But when we resist him, when he taps you on the shoulder and say, those kind of thoughts aren't like Jesus, and we say, we don't care, I like my fantasies, that grieves him. When we Wake up on Sunday morning and the Spirit says, you know, you're feeling kind of lonely. You ought to go to the church and be around other believers. And we say, I like being lonely. I like, I like wallowing in my suffering. We're grieving the Holy Spirit. When we wake up in the morning and we know we've made a commitment to read God's Word and we say, ah, I don't feel like it today. The Spirit's not on me today. That's, that's one that I've heard. That grieves the Holy Spirit. 
He's working to make us into the image of Jesus Christ. And that starts with a first step. Everybody starts in the same place. In uh, Acts chapter 2, the passage that was read just a little while ago, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter gives us the first step that we have to take. He's given his sermon. The people have said, oh, now what do we do? Oh, it's, uh, we've done wrong. What do we do about it? And Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How do we gain the advantage of the Spirit's guiding in our life? We start with repentance. Not the modern day understanding of repentance where we beat ourselves up so that maybe God will have pity on us. It's not the Latin understanding of uh, repentance. It's a, it's a word that means, the, the R-E means is an intensifier. It makes it even more powerful. And then penance is self-punishment. It is, in essence, saying Jesus' death on the cross wasn't enough. And fortunately, that's not what the Greek word actually means. I, I'm not the first one who said this. Many um, theologians are saying this now, that the, the Greek word metanoeo is the worst translated word in the English Bible. Because the Greek word metanoeo is the word meta, which in Greek means change, and nous, which means thinking. And they've been crammed together to mean think again. Reconsider. What's Peter saying to the people on the Temple Mount on the day of Pentecost? He says, you need to reconsider whether you need to keep coming here. You need to reconsider whether you need to keep offering sacrifices. Because Jesus has offered the ultimate sacrifice. And goats and lambs and turtle doves are no longer necessary. Jesus is sufficient. So think about your life that way and then be baptized. Baptism is the first act of obedience every believer is called to perform. Uh, it's our public declaration that we are going to think like Jesus or at least strive to think like Jesus from now on. I have a story of a lady who uh, was not growing in Christ. She was actually a, a deacon's wife in our church in Lee Summit, Missouri. And she uh, was frustrated that she wasn't growing in Christ. And she would frequently come and say, I don't understand this passage and my prayers are dry and I don't have the courage to witness. And finally, the pastor asked her, said, uh, you mean since you've been baptized, you've not had any growth at all? And she said, I've never been baptized. So we asked her a little bit about that, and she said, well, I, I, can't, I can't be baptized. I am absolutely terrified of water, and she, she did. She had a, a medical diagnosis of hydrophobia. She, she could not stand water at all, and it took a lot of coaxing to get her to get into that baptistry. I, I've uh, often thought that she was the person who got into the baptistry the, the slowest and got out the fastest. It was like all one motion. As she come up from under the water, it was like, boom, out of the water. Uh, she was absolutely terrified. But the next week she came in and she said, Mike, did you ever see this in the Bible before? I've never seen this before. This is great. And the next week she came in and she says, my, my prayers are so exciting now. She even said, I, I met a stranger in the grocery store the other day, and I actually told her about Jesus. She took the first step of obedience, and the Spirit led her into tremendous growth. Now, I'm not promising that if you don't feel like you're growing fast enough, you can get baptized and you'll start growing fast enough. That's the Spirit's work. I'm just showing an illustration of obedience through baptism and public declaration is the first act of obedience that we perform and the Spirit builds on that. Now the problem with this verse, where this problem comes from, is in the little conjunction a little bit further down. Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins. And that's a good translation. I like that translation. It gives me the chance to teach a little bit. And grammatically and linguistically, it's, the right, it's a good word to put in there. But even in English, that little word for has two meanings. 
It's a, it's a conjunction in English, by the way. In uh, Greek, it's a preposition. It's the, it's the Greek word ice. And it means to arrive at a point of destination. And many people have taken this verse and say, well, to arrive at, rep- at, uh, at forgiveness of sins, you have to repent and you have to be baptized. And they, we get the whole doctrine of baptismal regeneration, which is not correct, by the way. We don't have to be baptized to be saved. We have to be back- baptized to be obedient. I have an illustration of how this works in the real world. When I grew up, some of you know, just a little bit south, about 30 miles south of Abilene, Kansas. Okay? Abilene's big claim to fame today is its cow town. They've got a, a, the old-fashioned cow town, and they would do the, you know, shoot 'em up things, shows every Sunday afternoon. And they had a, a, um, a souvenir store. And I can remember when I was about eight years old, I don't know why I thought this, but I was in the souvenir store, and they were selling wanted posters. And one of the wanted posters was wanted, right across the top, wanted. There's a picture of a man there, his hand-drawing thing, and it says, Jesse James for bank robbery. And somehow I got it in my head that they were putting up a picture because they couldn't find Jesse James because they had this bank they wanted robbed and only Jesse James could do it. Same confusion here. Four can mean because you've already arrived at. Four can mean because. Because you have forgiveness of sins, repent and be baptized. So if you haven't been baptized and you've put your trust in Jesus, let me know. We can help you with that first act of obedience. Now, every spiritual gift in the church brings with it one um, jeopardy, one um, error that can happen. And in with the gift of evangelism can come, not doesn't have to, but can come the error of believing that once you are saved, you're done. But we learn from this passage today that once you become a believer in Jesus Christ, that's when it really starts. And so although we all start at the same first step, oftentimes we grow at different rates and different paces with different techniques. And we need to cooperate with the Spirit in our growth as well. We need to read His Word and let Him point out to us the things that we need to know. Sometimes I'll talk to a new believer and they'll, they'll say, well, I tried to read that Bible, but I don't understand any of it. I said, that's good. It's good that you don't understand it. Let me just ask you, if you were worshiping a God and you could understand everything about him, would he be enough? No. We need a God who's bigger than us. We need a God who knows what we need to know and won't press the things that we don't need to know. And so we need to just read his word and let the spirit teach us from what we read. And if he chooses not to teach us anything that day, remember that what we read may be something we'll need next year or the year after. And trust the spirit to bring that to our mind when we need it. I think a brand new believer, the vast majority of time, grows the most by being in the word of God. And I think after a couple of decades of reading the Word of God, that becomes more of a maintenance. And growth begins to happen more in prayer. It's not an instant change. It kind of transitions between the two. It may actually transition back and forth, where sometimes the Word of God is really teaching us. Other times our prayers are really teaching us. And the Spirit's really speaking to us and bringing truth to our mind from the Scripture in our prayer life. The point is, however the Spirit is leading us, we need to trust Him that he's going to take us where we need to go and trust him to produce the things that need to be produced in our life. Things like hope when we're feeling the pain. When life hurts, we have hope because the Spirit is working in our life. When we're afraid, the Spirit gives us confidence that he will never leave us or forsake us. What can man do to us? When we feel shame, like our very existence is valueless, we can recognize that we are accepted by God because of what Jesus has done for us. And the Spirit will remind you that you are acceptable through Jesus Christ to God Almighty. 
since Jesus isn't physically present, we can rely on the Holy Spirit. That's what he's here for. Because Jesus has risen from the dead and ascended to his Father, we have that personal connection with God himself. Let's pray. Father, it's difficult to understand the Holy Spirit and the ministry that he has in our lives. I thank you for that. I, I'm glad that you are so much greater than us that we cannot grasp all the details. I thank you that your spirit is here to reveal the details that we need and that he has your word to feed us and guide us and build a relationship on. Father, I pray that starting today, each one of us will be more aware of your reality And what makes that good news is what Jesus has done for us and that we will be willing to follow your spirit as he guides us to understand it even better. I thank you for all of it in Jesus' name. Amen.